Hello, everyone, and welcome to the state peer to peer learning session. Please note the session is being recorded. All participants are currently muted. You may submit questions and comments into the chat box throughout the meeting. You can access closed captions by clicking on the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. And I will now turn the call over to NASBIN moderator, Wendy Morris, Senior Behavioral Health Advisor. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. We are so delighted that you are here with us today. I think you're going to find we have a really great lineup of speakers, and uh, we will have time for some questions and answers at the end. And at the very end, we're going to do some informal dialogue. So it's uh, going to be we're going to have some good time together. I want to start by introducing uh, Dr. Belina Shaw, Senior Medical Advisor and Center for Mental Health Services Liaison to the 988 and Behavioral Health Service uh, Crisis Coordinating Office at SAMHSA. Thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Shaw. Thank you for having me, and I'm very excited to be here um, to open up this learning collaborative on mobile crisis models and model staffing. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Dr. Belina Shaw. I am one of the senior medical advisors in the Center for Mental Health Services at SAMHSA. I'm a psychiatrist, a board certified in child, adolescent, adult, and addictions. Um, but prior to SAMHSA, um, I never have really worked in mobile crisis per se, but I did work in youth mobile treatment in Baltimore City. So I know the value of community-based care to individuals who needed uh, for people to come to them. And so um, before I came to SAMHSA, I've been here a little less than a year, I worked to develop my own community's crisis continuum. And so I'm aware of, I'm very well aware of the thrill of the growth in this emerging field, but also the challenges of often building a plane as you fly it. And with the transition to 988 um, from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, um, we had um, a multi-million dollar grant over several years to be able to, to grow and build out our crisis continuum in our local health department where I was working. And I was able to, to really see at that point the firsthand challenges and difficulties in bridging the chasm between the guidelines and implementation. And so obviously there are multiple issues such as workforce, software, connection to the lifeline, training, um, specialized populations such as youth, that law enforcement interface, and workforce, workforce, workforce. Um, and so obviously there's a lot to do, but we're in a golden window of opportunity. And um, we really have this opportunity to take this nation's behavioral health crisis and in the infancy of the 988 transition and make transformative change in the crisis continuum. So I'm excited to introduce this learning collaborative and they'll focus on expanding the, the workforce capacity and promoting 24-7 uh, coverage for mobile crisis teams. As we know through research from um, NRI, that, that is definitely still a gap in within the country, although there are more and more teams that are being um, formed and expanded. And um, in this presentation, we'll feature uh, uh, an overview of the research of um, the, a mobile crisis study that uh, Dr. Matt Goldman was one of the um, PIs and authors of um, and has recently been published. And then we'll also share some exemplar presentations by Jenna Soleski, uh, Crisis Services Coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Health Services, um, Division of Care and Treatment Services, and Dana Began, um, David, Dana Be Began, I'm sorry if I just mis mispronounced your name, Dana, um, the Director of Evidence-Based Practices and, uh, and Grants um, at the Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Um, so I'll first start by introducing Dr. Goldman. Dr. Goldman recently began a new role as the Medical Director for the King County Crisis Center Le Le uh, Levy, Levy, an implementation plan, a voter improved levy implementation plan. A voter improved initiative invests 1.25 billion in crisis centers and new residential facilities, as well as workforce development programs across Seattle and King County. Prior to joining King County, he was the medical director for the Com comprehensive crisis services in the San Francisco Department of Public Health, where he had direct clinical and administrative oversight of a crisis call center and adult and child mobile crisis teams. He led planning for 988 implementation and advised on the development of new crisis stable of a new crisis stabilization unit. 
Dr. Goldman is a volunteer clinical assistant professor at the US at the US UCSF Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He serves as a board member of the American Association of Community Psychiatry, and he sits on the expanding first response commission for the Council of State Governments Justice Center, as well as he's serving on the National Council for Mental Wellbeing's Medical, Medical Director Institute, where he co-chairs a committee on crisis services. Um, and um, there's also some really great work coming out of that committee with uh, multiple papers and, and, um, and hopefully he'll highlight a little bit of that as, as well. He is a physician science scientist and has received grant funding to study mental health and substance use crisis services and suicide prevention in California, Arizona, and Georgia, and Ohio. So it's my honor always to hear what Matt has to say, and, um, and I really do love your blending of community work um, as well as science and really making sure that we're getting implementation science into the field. So thanks, Matt. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Belina. Really nice to see you here and um, appreciate your shout out for the National Council's uh, medical director work that you have been also a very important partner in developing uh, the materials that have come out from that group. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. As um, Dr. Shaw just reviewed, I really do speak from the perspective uh, as a clinician. I'm a psychiatrist, but I've worked mobile crisis now for years um, as you know, somebody responsible for administering and implementing programs. And, you know, uh, as a researcher and trying to understand, you know, where are the gaps in the evidence base for this field? I'm very excited to share with you um, some uh, important findings that will help frame the conversation today. Um, so if we can go into my slides, that would be great. Oh, I think this is the great. And we can go on into the next one. Thank you. Um, so just at the top, uh, acknowledgments and disclosures, as uh, uh, Dr. Shaw mentioned, this has very much been a team effort. I want to acknowledge my colleague, Preston Looper, who's a co-investigator on this work, as well as the rest of my team. Um, this uh, uh, findings from this National Mobile Crisis Team survey that we're going to be sharing was developed in partnership with SAMHSA, NASHBID, and Vibrant Emotional Health. Um, and also want to disclose that both uh, uh, Preston Looper and myself are paid consultants for Vibrant Emotional Health, and that's uh, a contract under whose auspices we were able to complete this work. Um, I'll also just give an additional disclaimer that these uh, data represent my own views and not anything related to my day job uh, with King County. Um, we can go to the next slide. So uh, what was this survey? So this uh, was, again, we call this the National Mobile Crisis Team Survey. Um, and the goal of doing this was really to increase our understanding about the landscape of how mobile crisis teams or MCTs, as you'll see it appear throughout this presentation, are configured nationally. Um, this was the most comprehensive national survey of mobile teams to date. And our goal was to describe baseline characteristics of mobile teams as they currently exist, as well as identifying gaps in services across the United States. Um, and our aims here were to inform the development of local, state, and federal roadmaps for crisis care systems. We wanted to directly inform all of those systems across the U.S. that I know that you're all involved in. You know, so where do we begin? How do we do this better? Where are others? And, and really help answer those questions. Um, next slide. So our methods here was to basically you know, create a survey and distribute it to a long list of everyone who we could think of. Hopefully some of you are even familiar with the survey that we administered last year. Um, uh, we sent it out through various listservs, email lists, et cetera. Uh, the survey included 73 detailed questions about a range of topics. We focused on service areas and partnerships, program and team structure, clinical scope, the use of technology, financing, billing, revenue, as well as quality and incentives. And so, you know, there's no way that I'm going to be able to talk about all of these different uh, components of our work uh, in, this, in this short time, but I wanted to share some of the highlights to help, again, um, frame the discussion. So next slide. Um, we got about 1,300 total responses. However, of those, um, we restricted our analysis just to those that included the state. So there were a lot 
of responses that were really just kind of click throughs. Those that did not indicate the state just had a couple questions answered. Um, whereas the ones that did indicate what state the respondent was from, um, plus also a round of deduplicating responses um, resulted in 554 total survey responses that we used in the analysis for the data that I'll share here. Um, respondents included a range of folks, 43% uh, were program directors, 19% were frontline clinicians, 12% clinical supervisors, as well as some CEOs and executive directors. And we received responses from 45 states um, where there was at least one response. There were a few that we didn't get a response, whether that's because of our sampling, not effectively uh, you know, reaching all of the potential respondents in those states, or because there's not any mobile crisis teams operating in those locations. I, I cannot say. We, we just know that we did not get an, uh, responses there. And you know, so it goes with survey research where you know, we do our best to disseminate the survey and get as many responses as we can, but it's very much an acknowledgement. Um, they're important to acknowledge that it's a limitation that we do not have, you know, every single mobile team that actually exists in the U.S. This is a convenient sample based on our uh, recruitment strategy. Uh, next slide. Um, and so I'm going to jump right in with what we found. So um, at a high level, when we asked programs, what are the types of service areas that you serve? There was high variability in the geographic unit, the size of the population, and also the density of the populations that were served. So the biggest number, about 50%, over 50%, said that they serve a county level entity. Um, 171, so 30%, said that they re uh, serve a region, meaning more than one county. 5% serve state level, and 13% serve city or smaller. Um, related to that, but not fully overlapping, was population size. So, um, and this was interestingly split sort of a third, a third, a third, that about a third serve less than 100,000 people, a third serve between 100 and 500,000 people, and a third serve over 500,000 people. And you'll see throughout these slides that I'm going to use that kind of framework of smaller population, medium population, larger population to help organize some of the other findings because there are some interesting trends there. Um, we did also look at um, uh, population density and found that this is an interesting finding. 23% said that they really just serve rural or frontier uh, type areas. 34% said they serve only urban or suburban areas. But the biggest group, 43%, said that they serve a mixed density, meaning that they have some combination of low density and high density in the areas that they serve which as you can imagine means that you're not just dealing with city traffic and you're not just dealing with windy roads and downed trees and snow after a winter storm, you're dealing with both. And, and so you know, a lot of teams are facing those kind of structural challenges across the board. Next slide. Um, in terms of uh, clients served by mobile teams, so what's the number of clients that mobile teams are serving out in the world? Um, we organized this uh, based on the population size, as I mentioned a moment ago. So the light blue you can see is smaller cities, the medium blue is medium cities, dark blue is larger cities. And you can see a trend that we would expect. Uh, it's you know 57% of those teams that are serving over 500 clients a month are in larger cities. Although there are some, uh, sorry, when I say cities, I mean localities. They can also be counties or states. Um, whereas uh, you know 17% uh, of uh, teams that are serving smaller uh, catchment areas are still serving high volume. Um, at the flip side, uh, there are more of the smaller uh, uh, catchment area mobile teams that are serving fewer clients in the less than 200 clients a, a month range. Um, but there are also some programs that are serving over 500,000 people that see fewer than 200 clients. So what this helps sort of indicate is, you know, as you would expect, some mobile teams serve large regions uh, and serve a lot of clients and vice versa, but also some mobile teams that serve large regions are serving few clients and vice versa. Um, I also wanted to just point out in the lower left corner an important question around youth mobile crisis. So we asked all teams, do you serve adults, children, or both? 85% said that they serve all ages. Um, and so that was, um, uh, I think, a little bit of a surprising finding, but I think encouraging in terms of access to mobile crisis care for youth. 
Uh, there were just 4% that said they serve youth, uh, youth only and 11% saying that they only do serve adults. Next slide. Um, in terms of personnel, so what's like the team composition of these different mobile teams, again, broken down by uh, the population, you can see, you know, almost 100%, 98% percent total, I think, of mobile teams that responded to this question. So this is 381. And I mentioned all the questions are optional. So that's why the N for these responses varies somewhat depending on uh, which teams responded to which. Um, uh, so almost 100% uh, include any behavioral health provider. So that's, I think, validating of the study frame that we really wanted to capture mobile crisis teams, which broadly would include any team that includes a behavioral health clinician or provider as part of that team. Um, we did see responses from plenty of teams as well, though, that also include police and law enforcement, which sometimes are called co-responder teams. Um, as well as emergency medical technicians and paramedics, which are also sometimes called co-responder teams or community responder teams, um, although less of those, which that's sort of you know, popularly known as the CAHOOTS model um, based on the program in Eugene, Oregon. Um, about a third of programs reported including peer specialists on their mobile teams, and um, uh, about 30% included medical personnel, meaning nursing or psychiatry or a medical director type role. Um, uh, what was a bit interesting, just in terms of the between the uh, catchment area population size variations, is that law enforcement and EMTs were more often part of teams in larger service areas. So you can see that blue bar is larger for those two um, workforces. Um, uh, for peers, they were more commonly seen um, uh, in the larger uh, service areas as well, whereas medical personnel were more commonly seen in the smaller areas. Um, those are not huge differences, but still notable trends um, worth commenting on. Uh, next slide. We also looked at total FTE, so full-time equivalents, meaning you know a 40-hour work week per staff. Because you might think, well, it's just you know you only need one behavioral health clinician to staff a mobile crisis team for a given week. But that's if you want that mobile team to only be working 40 hours a week. As I'm sure you're all very familiar, we're shooting for 24/7 here with mobile crisis most of the time. And so our estimate is, you know, we tend to use sort of a rule of thumb that five, five and a half FTE of a clinician is what's really needed for full 24/7 coverage. And so we ran those numbers. We decided to break down these FTE reports across all different staff types um, by looking at how many programs had less than six FTE, had six to 11 FTE. So less than six meaning like barely slash maybe not even enough staffing for full 24 seven operations with just one clinician. Six to 11, meaning that there's enough staffing for one or two clinicians 24 seven. 11 uh, to 16, meaning that there is enough staffing for two clinicians to be on a team of two 24-7, plus even up to 16 FTE, having enough for an additional clinician to potentially help staff during, um, you know, more, uh, 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 or having additional team staff during a higher volume uh, times, and then into the larger sort of thresholds of 16 to 25, and then 25 and above. For 25 and above FTE programs, those are very large programs. And you can see again how this breaks down based on population size. So you can see some of those smaller catchment areas are more represented in the very small teams where there's less than six FTE. Um, but there are some very large catchment areas that are being served um, by very few actual mobile crisis team staff, which would then have direct implications for number of calls that they'd be able to respond to, number of hours that they'd be able to cover, um, response times, you know, all kinds of other factors. So um, breaking things down in this way by FTE was really meant to um, focus on sort of, you know, capacity for teams to respond. And we can see that there are trends here, but there are still, you know, some sort of you know, uh, un unexpected findings in terms of how some uh, catchment areas, large and small, are currently staffed. Um, uh, we did also ask a separate question of uh, programs, uh, whether they report 24-hour operations, and 70% said that they did. And that's interesting because when we look at those teams that have fewer than 11 FTE, 
um, that's 53% of programs, meaning that they don't have enough staffing to operate a single two-person team 24-7. So the FTE versus the 24-hour operations balance, it's sort of two different ways of getting at the same question, but um, a little bit of a discrepancy there, which I think, again, is an important uh, sort of area for future understanding. Uh, next slide. I know I'm going through a lot of information here really quickly, but want to want to get this out to you um, to share. Um, so shared staff, another really important question, especially for feasibility and implementation, you know, to operate in mobile teams, how are programs getting those staff given workforce shortages? Um, mobile teams serving smaller catchment areas are more likely to share staff with behavioral outpatient services. So you can see that top bar uh, where behavioral health outpatient clinics um, that are sharing staff with mobile teams, over um, half of those are in uh, smaller catchment areas. Larger settings are more likely to share staff with crisis call lines or crisis receiving facilities, which was also sort of interesting that there was some blending there. Uh, but you can see across the board, it was about half of programs reported sharing staff with different um, kinds of settings like behavioral health, crisis call lines, and um, uh, crisis facilities. Next slide. Um, funding sources, of course, a major point of interest. Um, uh, 226 of the programs that responded to this question reported braided funding, meaning that they were receiving funding from insurance, uh, federal block grants and or state and regional funding. Um, smaller service areas were more often relying only on federal block grants. So see that uh, uh, that third bar down there, that um, light blue section, although it's a little hard to see, is proportionally larger compared to the others in terms of the share of uh, federal block um, mobile crisis teams that are um, uh, serving you know, those smaller catchment areas. Uh, larger service areas are more often relying only on state and regional funding. So also interesting that um, some of the larger programs um, seem to have those state and regional uh, funding uh, relationships as well. And very few are 100% relying on insurance only at this point, which of course is of interest for sustainability. Next slide. Uh, how to reach mobile teams. So this was a study that we've had published in Psychiatric Services earlier this year um, that looked just at this one question. When you're trying to reach a mobile team, what number should I call? You can see 65% reported that they're internal and self-dispatched. Just over half can be dispatched by 911 or reached by 911. Um, Local uh, hotlines like 211 and 311 were involved in over half of uh, mobile team uh, respondent programs. Um, law enforcement also represented at about half. Uh, many programs could be reached uh, through uh, mental health clinics. And interestingly, that red star is supposed to be next to the third to last one, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline Call Center is now, of course, known as 988. Only 32% of respondents said that at the time of the survey, which was last year, um, that they were reachable um, through 988. So clearly, this is an area of active development and something that we're partnering with Vibridge on uh, to really you know, develop the 988 mobile crisis interface. Uh, next slide. Uh, vehicles used for transportation. This is something that Richard McKeon had asked me to call out in particular in sharing some of these results because he thought this is so important and I agree with him. Um, really thinking about, so how, how are mobile teams involved in transport? How does this work? It's so important operationally and can really limit scope of services. Um, uh, mobile team programs that responded serving smaller areas tend to use their personal vehicles more often. Maybe not a surprise, but those sort of lower resource teams, um, lower catchment area teams tend to have to rely on personal vehicles. Um, program owned vehicles, police cruisers and ambulances more often used in larger service areas. So sort of the flip side of that same coin. Um, but you can see just overall in terms of the gross number of respondents to this question, um, you know, more, most programs, you know, the, the most commonly responded answer here was personal vehicles. Um, Program-owned vehicles came next, and then, you know, there are still a substantial number that are using police cruisers. Next slide. Uh, connections to community resources. So this is so important. Mobile teams do not exist in a vacuum. They must be partnering with local resources to really be able to link people. Um, 
And uh, we found across the board here some variability, um, but definitely still room for growth and some gaps. Only 56% of respondents said that they have arrangements with behavioral health outpatient providers for post-crisis care. Um, there is minimal use of integrated EHRs, electronic health records, which may impede information sharing at the time of a crisis. Um, and you can see, you know, overall, the, the highest rate was 73% that programs do track referrals to outpatient-based services. So at least they're, you know, trying to follow up, but that they don't necessarily have those relationships to really facilitate um, the follow-up care, um, which I think is, you know, somewhat of a gold standard. 56% um, do have uh, an arrangement for, um, oh, I'm sorry, that was, that was the same question for drop-off and care transitions. Um, I think I covered everything relevant in the slide, but let's go to the next one just in the interest of time. So at a high level, what are the takeaways from all of this data that I just raced through? Um, mobile programs are as diverse as the areas they serve. There is tremendous variability in how the teams are composed across the US. Um, and you know, the US itself is quite diverse in terms of you know, population density, area size, catchment areas, all these different pieces. Um, there may be some significant gap between the vision and reality for mobile team scale and reach. So this question of you know, serving mobile 24-7 everywhere in the U.S., we're a long way off from that. And a big issue there relates to staffing, having enough staff to really be able to cover a 24-7 service at the number of teams that are really required to respond to the call volume and meet um, response time standards. Uh, mobile teams report limits to operational integration across the crisis continuum, so need for more uh, relationship between 988 and mobile crisis, between mobile crisis and downstream settings like facilities and outpatient referrals post-crisis, and little research has been done to guide implementation of best practices in mobile teams themselves. So we're trying to take a first step on that path, but there's a lot of work yet to be done. Um, and hopefully these findings are helpful. So I think on the next slide is, do I have my email there? Yes, um, matthew.goleman at ucsf.edu. If you'd like to reach out, um, please do be in touch. Happy to follow up. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldman. That was just fantastic. Really intriguing uh, data. I. I appreciate the way you really compared trends in rural, rural areas versus urban and, and small versus large catchment areas. And um, especially appreciate your takeaways. We, we, we do have a long ways to go to fill the gap to the vision, but we're really new at this. So it's, it's an exciting time to be part of this work and so appreciative um, of you being here today. So thank you. Thank you. All right, it is now uh, my pleasure to introduce our next two speakers. We're gonna hear from uh, Wisconsin and Connecticut on um, their respective programs. For, so first we're gonna hear um, from Jenna Suleski, uh, who is a licensed mental health clinician and a crisis service coordinator for the Wisconsin Department of Health Services. In her current role, she works with a multidisciplinary team providing assistance and oversight to emergency behavioral health programs and crisis services in Wisconsin. Jenna spent most of her career as a federal probation officer focusing on individuals with severe and persistent mental illness recently released to the community from federal incarceration. She's worked in crisis services in both Milwaukee and Madison. And as a crisis clinician in Milwaukee County, Jenna worked as a co-responder on a co-responder team with the Milwaukee Police Department responding to active behavioral health calls. And after we hear from Jenna, we'll hear from uh, Dana Vegan. Dana is the director of the Evidence-Based Practices and Grants Division at the Office of the Commissioner within the State of Connecticut Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. She's a registered and licensed occupational therapist and has more than 17 years of experience in mental health. Dana is the creator of a functional assessment called the Learning Inventory of Skills Development, which is a tool that has been used statewide in the Department of Children and Families for Youth ages 14 and older. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Jenna. Thank you both for being here. Thank you for that introduction, Wendy. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Wendy said, my name is Jenna Seleski. I'm a crisis services coordinator uh, for the Wisconsin Department of Health's Mental Health Services section. 
And I know I don't have a ton of time, so I'm going to also breeze <laughs> through a lot of things. Um, but like many other states, Wisconsin DHS has been foc focusing a lot of funding um, and staff power on a lot of areas of expansion within the crisis continuum. And I was happy to hear from Dr. Goldman about kind of the national level data collection that's going on. We similarly in our state are doing kind of a statewide pull of the landscape of all crisis services. Uh, throughout our state, including mobile crisis response and teams. Um, so we're hopefully going to be uh, getting some more information as, as that data rolls in um, and we kind of parse through that. So um, I will go to the next slide. So one of the primary areas that we are enhancing is mobile crisis response. Um, in Wisconsin, we are a county run state and therefore we have various ways that crisis services are provided, um, including mobile crisis response. We have 72 counties in our state. Um, so they're you know, quite a mixture of rural and urban and uh, no two county actually really looks the same when it comes to how mobile crisis services are provided. Um, so with ARPA federal funds, we were able to focus on a state plan amendment to allow for a federal medical assistance percentage increase. So the FMAP increased to about 85% claiming. Um, and so this was a systemic increase that we were able to kind of roll out. Um, that is really to reimburse crisis response teams at an enhanced rate uh, and incentivizes counties to utilize multidisciplinary kind of teams, personnel. Uh, this includes peers, psychiatric nurses, substance use focused clinicians, telepsychiatry, um, kind of anybody that you would think would be maybe super beneficial in some of those mobile calls um, that's not just in the lane of a, of a clinician. Um, so, Part of this expansion and part of this reimbursement and enhancement also requires an advanced training to the providers on the, on the mobile crisis teams. So that's the part that we're going to focus on, that second part of training. Um, next slide. So some of just the logistical background of how this enhanced FMAP for mobile crisis teams will look in Wisconsin um, includes kind of these listed requirements. So completing that additional training that I mentioned, having 24 seven availability, which I know Dr. Goldman alluded to as being this very difficult thing to obtain, staffing issues, um, and then also some, some counties and providers saying, yes, we do that but no, we don't have the staff to do that. So kind of that conflict, conflicting information of, uh, are we really able to provide 24 seven availability for these services? Um, and then lastly, the services for this enhanced reimbursement rate are for services provided at non-hospital based settings. Um, again, so kind of making sure that we are providing as many services and you know, reimbursing at a higher rate for as much community engagement and involvement as we can. Um, so counties can only be reimbursed at this high rate um, for two professionals if their county offers crisis services 24-7, if the response being reimbursed is to a non-hospital setting, um, and if those providers and professionals have completed that advanced mobile crisis team training. Um, so the expansion of all of this has been a bit of a, a long time coming. We have this rollout going from last year. We have counties uh, aware of it and able to try to meet those requirements and standards, which will take up most of this year. And then that FMAP enhanced claiming will be available in January of 2024. Next slide. So back to the training piece. Um, I think some context is, is necessary for us uh, before I outline the advanced mobile crisis teaming training. Um, so in Wisconsin, uh, we, you know, um, any mental health service at crisis services system that's county based, some way, somehow, we have created the ability for all crisis staff throughout the entire state to have some uniformity in training. So, DHS uh, contracts and partners with a state university, the University of Wisconsin at Green Bay, and their behavioral health training partnership program to provide what is considered a crisis core training curriculum. So this basic core training is available to all crisis staff statewide. Um, however, it's not required and not everyone necessarily 
utilizes it, but it is available to every crisis staff statewide, whether you are a clinician on a mobile team, whether you are a call taker um, at 988 or a county crisis line, whether you are working in a crisis stabilization facility, this training, this core training is available to every crisis staff statewide. So during the implementation and kind of creation of that state plan amendment um, and just the inception of the mobile crisis teaming concept in general for Wisconsin, UW Green Bay worked with DHS to develop an additional enhanced advanced curriculum to provide to staff who will serve on mobile crisis teams. Um, so again, this could be those substance use providers, this could be those peers, this could be just our, our typical crisis clinicians. Um, so we created that as a group together. So it was in collaboration with UWGB, um, but we took input from so many sections from DHS, including our mental health section, our substance use services section, harm reduction services, peer services. Um, so kind of across the board, we were able to get input as to how to best create this advanced training specific to mobile crisis team uh, teaming training. Um, so UW Green Bay, they, they really do utilize diverse trainers. They have their own um, group and list of, of professionals that they tap into for certain uh, areas, certain selected subject areas. Um, and then the curriculum that was ended that we created and what we ended up with, it turned into being kind of a hybrid of self-paced and virtual training sessions. Next slide. So kind of in concert with the creation of the curriculum, DHS and UW Green Bay, we worked together to determine kind of the best way to roll this out and to try to figure out, you know, how do we get some pretty candid feedback and figure out if this is, if this is helpful, if this is going to work. So what we did, um, again, most of our section uh, staff at the state level were able to you know, provide input and expertise into, into the curriculum. Um, and ultimately, we kind of determined that a pilot was the best way to start this off. So um, we did have, I think it was about seven of our counties. Um, we had uh, seven of our counties. We had a handful of our state staff go through it. Uh, this really did allow us to get that kind of candid feedback from county level personnel. And, and that was the place that the training was going to be most appropriate and most utilized. And so we really did want to have that feedback from the people who were going to be trained and using these uh, trainings and using this information and trying to find a way to make sure that anything that we could get as feedback, we could completely do revisions and figure out a way that it would be as helpful to staff as possible. Um, so at the beginning of this year, we ran the pilot. Uh, again, we had those seven counties. We had our DHS staff um, for a handful of those. It was a really big lift. <laughs> um, it's it's 46 hours of instruction. So it was a lot. And we were able to get a lot of good feedback from county personnel, from DHS. We gave feedback. Um, so the 46 hours of instruction includes um, everything that's listed there, the mobile crisis teaming with adults and youth, substance use um, in crisis intervention, harm reduction in crisis intervention, peer support with crisis services, self-awareness and co-regulation, which is similar to like de-escalation skills, um, and working with individuals at elevated risk of suicide via telehealth. And then there was also a self-paced portion, um, which is about 10 hours. Um, and that was kind of just an overview, mobile crisis teaming, which was you know, working with peers, mobile teaming, secondary trauma, substance use disorders, um, effective telehealth, all of that. So we did receive a lot of feedback. We we got feedback relating to redundancies. We got feedback relating to, um, you know, making sure that certain areas are crisis crisis specific, that it's not just how do you do telehealth with anybody? How do you do telehealth with people in crisis? Um, very, very different. <laughs> um, and then also, you know, just feedback about trainers' expertise or not, or, you know, crisis-specific services or not, um, relevant or not, or did we cover this 14 times and we didn't need to, kind of a thing. Um, so we really did take a lot of consideration from those pilot participants, um, and revisions are being made, and then we will roll, we'll roll out to the entire state for this uh, required training for this enhanced rate reimbursement. Next slide. 
And then I just, yeah, I just want to say, you know, I think that somehow we have this advantage in mobile crisis teaming, and it's definitely the ability to have provided some standardized training um, to those serving on a mobile crisis team. Um, you know, should the county want that enhanced reimbursement rate, um, they're going to have to go through this. But also, even at the bare minimum, everyone in our state has the ability to get a standardized crisis core training. Um, so I'm hopeful that that's not terribly unique. I would love to see a lot of states being be doing something like that. Um, I know, you know, we frequently get feedback at the state level when it comes to staff shortages, burnout, job unhappiness um, in the crisis field. It's a lot of times related to this imposter syndrome feeling or feeling ill prepared for some of this work. Um, so we also hope that this kind of enhanced and advanced training will really aid in, in workforce retention. Um, so please feel free to reach out and connect. I know I have some other staff on the call as well who I work with, um, and we can definitely connect you to anybody in the state that might be helpful. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you for taking time to listen to Wisconsin's semi-unique crisis services training approach. Um, and I will hand it over to Dana to discuss Connecticut's system. Thank you, Jenna. That was a wonderful and very informative presentation. I know I will probably be reaching out to you uh, for more information on that. Um, that was fantastic and very comprehensive. So thank you for your presentation. Um, so what I'm going to just present on um, relatively briefly is are some of the, the strategies that we're using in Connecticut to um, attract and hire uh, clinicians for our adult mobile crisis teams. Um, in Connecticut, we do have a dual system. Um, I think that there was just a question in the chat for Wisconsin, if you're adult and youth, or if you're just adult, but um, in Connecticut, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services uh, serves adults ages 18 and over. Um, and our sister agency, the Department of Children and Families, serves youth under the age of 18. Um, although our systems are very similar, um, the content that I'll be providing is really specific to our adult mobile crisis team. So you can go to uh, the next slide. Thank you. So in Connecticut, um, we have 18 adult mobile crisis teams statewide. Um, 10 of them are operated by private nonprofit providers that are funded by the department, and eight are operated by DEMAS state employees. Um, the teams are composed of staff from multiple disciplines. So uh, teams include clinicians, they include paraprofessionals, nurses, doctors, peers. Um, although we are trying to expand the number of peers on our mobile crisis teams, um, some of our mobile crisis teams do have peers um, and a variety of, of other disciplines. Um, and just to give you a sense of the volume, um, in last state fiscal year, fiscal year 22, mobile crisis teams performed approximately 8,000 crisis evaluations. And that means the in-person clinical assessments. Um, so that's around the amount of, of volume uh, that we're doing in the adult system. Um, our mobile crisis clinicians, although it varies across the state, um, some of them are embedded in um, local PDs, police departments, uh, and have that co-response model. Um, and some uh, are available, all really are available to work if they're not embedded uh, to work with law enforcement. And in Connecticut, um, we have seen a significant increase in the amount of calls that our mobile crisis teams are getting from law enforcement to accompany them uh, on, on calls that, that they're getting, which we're really pleased in seeing because law enforcement is recognizing that the situation is better handled by a behavioral health professional rather than law enforcement. So that's something that we're really um, glad to be seeing in Connecticut, and we really have some very strong partnerships with the local police departments with our mobile crisis teams. Um, so in Connecticut, um, our mobile crisis teams had not been operating 24-7. Uh, and quite frankly, all 18 adult teams had um, very different hours of operation, 
Some were operating on a first and second shift. Some were only operating on first shift, but it varied significantly across the state. Fortunately, uh, in the last two years, really, um, we were appropriated um, annualized ongoing funding to expand our mobile crisis teams to be able to operate 24 seven and provide in-person response 24 seven. So while we have been very fortunate to be allocated the funding to do this, um, we have had some significant challenges in um, hiring individuals for our mobile crisis teams. Um, as you all are aware across the country, um, there are hiring challenges and staffing shortages everywhere. Um, and so we're definitely feeling that um, with uh, trying to hire our mobile crisis clinicians. So if you wanna just jump to the next slide. Great. So, um, you know, some of the challenges that we are finding is that, you know, mobile crisis is really a niche service to begin with, right? Um, not all clinicians, not all, um, you know, disciplines or professionals um, are, are comfortable with mobile crisis work. So that's uh, a, a unique challenge um, to, in, in this work to begin with. Um, secondly, we are definitely finding that um, second and in particular third shifts um, were having an exceptionally hard time um, finding staff for. And you know, there is that hesitation of going mobile, if you will, going out into the community at two, three o'clock in the morning, right? Um, so those are those are some some things that we're trying to work through. And um, as I think we are probably seeing throughout the country, many of our licensed clinicians are now providing telehealth as a result of the pandemic. And clearly, you can't provide mobile crisis services uh, via telehealth, or at least probably not not um, as 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 well as you can in person. Um, so, uh, given those challenges, some of the strategies that we are using in Connecticut is that we are trying to offer more flexible work schedules. So instead of your um, typical five days a week, eight hour shifts, um, we're looking to offer four 10 hour days. Um, so four days on, three days off. Uh, and and uh, we've seen that there's been an interest in that. So, so that's uh, starting to work well. The other thing that um, we're trying to um, implement is the ability for mobile crisis clinicians to be on call at home. So on second or third shift, they are at home, they have their mobile crisis phone, they're taking calls and they're triaging calls from home Sometimes the call is just talking to somebody. Sometimes the call is just some, you know, somebody to listen to the individual and, and what's going on. And then obviously there are those other calls that do require a mobile response and for that clinician to go out to see that person and do a more um, comprehensive assessment. So in order to um, recognize that, we are um, paying clinicians a certain rate for taking the calls from home and then a differential rate for actually going out um, and doing a mobile response and doing a crisis assessment. So, and that seems to also be um, more attractive than having to be in an office building throughout the middle of the night, right? Um, and only going out when a mobile assessment needs to take place. Um, we're also pairing licensed clinicians with other paraprofessionals or peers um, so instead of um, feeling that we have a need to have the team of two individuals, both being licensed professionals, um, we are having a licensed person paired with a paraprofessional or a peer as the team. Um, we had for quite some time um, had our teams be both licensed individuals, but now we're recognizing that we can use paraprofessionals or peers with that clinician. Um, especially peers are very uh, beneficial in those teams. Um, the other thing that in Connecticut that for whatever reason was just tended to be our standard practice was that we had mainly LCSWs um, who were on, uh, who were the clinicians on our mobile crisis teams. Um, we have since started um, adding 
LPCs and LMFTs to the teams. So we've expanded the pool of applicants, not just to LCSWs, but to also other licensed disciplines. Um, and that seems to be helping as well. Um, we've also um, just started to provide some direct mailings. So we are in the process of getting um, from our Department of Public Health, all of the individuals that are licensed clinical social workers, LPCs or LMFTs, and we are planning to do direct mailings to all of those licensed disciplines to let them know of these position openings um, in the hopes of, of attracting. Um, funny thing with the state is that um, postings are not always uh, publicized as well as they can be. So we're hoping that these direct mailings will, will help with that. And then some of our private nonprofit agencies are able to offer some, some you know, sign-on bonuses, retention bonuses, that type of a thing for their staff, which has obviously also been incredibly helpful. So these were just some of the strategies. Um, I'm sure they're not unique to our state. I'm guessing many other states are trying these as well, but we're really trying to think outside the box and be creative uh, around how we can attract more individuals to our mobile crisis teams. Um, and I believe that is my last slide. So if you wanna go, yep, there we go. And there is my contact information. Um, if anybody wants to feel free to reach out and if you have any questions. So thank you for having me here today. Thank you both so much. What great presentations. I uh, took lots of notes and uh, I'm sure others did as well. So for the audience, we uh, have about 25 minutes dedicated to questions and answers. So if you wanna put those questions in the chat box, that will be great. And any of our speakers, um, including Dr. Shaw um, from SAMHSA are happy to uh, take your questions. And then, as I said, at the very end, we'll do some informal dialogue, but for now we are, uh, happy to to take your questions. And I know there was a question that, I, that kind of got answered um, and it was for you, Jenna, about whether your teams serve adults and youth. And I think someone else from your team responded in the chat that it is, you used to have a team also for youth, but now it's for both. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Milwaukee used to have a dedicated youth uh, mobile response team, but uh, they found similarly with staffing issues, post-COVID issues, um, that staffing two separate teams was not feasible. So um, it kind of became absorbed into one major um, mobile crisis team, which it, the feedback that we've gotten thus far with that is that it's actually seemed to have been beneficial because they can kind of go into one call if there's family involved, if there's children involved, um, that expertise is fully there um, and they can kind of address multiple uh, issues in one call if needed. So um, yeah, at this point, no, nowhere in Wisconsin has a specific youth mobile team, um, but part of our survey as well that we completed in all 72 counties of our state filled this out, which is phenomenal, um, was asking, is there any specialized mobile team outside of your crisis mobile team that you utilize? So again, hopefully we'll be a little informed by that in the next couple of months here. Great. The questions are starting to, to flow, which is great. So this next question um, comes to us from uh, Megan Riddle, who asks uh, Dana, she says, maybe I missed it, but are you able to cover 24 seven with your four 10 hour shifts? Yes, so um, we've, we've designed it so that those four 10 hour shifts um, would cover 24 hours, yes. Great. And then we have a question from Rebecca Botter asking if the advanced training curriculum um, I think, Jenna, that you talked about, is that available? Can that be shared? Is that something that our audience can uh, look at? I can definitely put the link to UW Green Bay Partnership in the chat. Um, the advanced teaming training, I think, is still being flushed out with a lot of those feedback based revisions, um, but you could definitely see kind of the crisis core based training on UW Green Bay's uh, website. So I will put that in the chat shortly here. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then this next question, I think, is for you, Dana. It comes from uh, Violet uh, Bolstridge asking, and I know you spoke to how you pay your employees, whether they're taking 
calls or responding um, going out with the team. Is there a difference for how you bill? The question is, do you bill for the phone triage or only for the personal response? So that's a really good question. Um, and right now in Connecticut, uh, on the adult side, um, we do not bill uh, for mobile crisis. The child system does bill for mobile crisis, um, but we're in the process of exploring billing. Um, and our plan is that if we do end up uh, providing billable services, it would only be for the in-person responses and not for phone triage. Okay, great. Now we have, let's see, we have a two, okay, this is a long one. It's a two-parter. This comes to us from Darcy Miller. Um, the first question regarding staffing for 24-7. Did you explore on-call expectations with staffing solutions? And she knows that that's the only way that they can provide 24 coverage. So I imagine when uh, folks come into those, uh, when you have staff that come aboard, they understand we're trying to, to cover 24-7. Um, I, I'm not sure I really understand, understand the yes. question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when, when they're hired and we tell them that they'll be triaging. Yes. I mean, we've made it very clear to all of our mobile crisis teams that the goal is to provide, uh, services 24 seven and if necessary, mobile in-person services 24 seven. So, so yes, um, that is definitely the expectation. And then I think the second part, uh, Jenna, is for you. Is the 46-hour training all at once or broken out into segments? I can't imagine you go, I don't know, maybe you came it all day after day, right? Seems like a lot um, of information at once. It is a lot, yeah. And is it broken um, down by role, for instance, difference between peer, licensed, clinician, bachelor's level, et cetera? So it's not broken down by role. Anybody who wants to be on that team and reimbursed at that high rate does have to go through the entirety of that training. Um, it is not all at once. They they definitely set it up in a way where that self-paced 10 hours, you can get that ahead of time, do that on your own and do that throughout the training. Um, and then they also have to keep in mind the, um, the amount of trainers and presenters that they have for those more live virtual trainings. And that schedule is not back to back. Um, so it is a mixed bag as to when it all occurs. I know when we piloted it, it actually not even including the self-paced part um, spanned over two weeks, you know, with a two hour chunk here and a four hour chunk here and et cetera. So um, that's how we did it with the pilot. And I would presume that it would look similar um, as it's actually fully rolled out. All right. And we, we do have some more questions in the chat that I'm going to get to. Uh, let me ask this question first, though. Can you, both of you talk to us a little bit about how you connect with 988 and where your calls come from? And then, Dr. Shaw, maybe you could kind of chime in on, on your thoughts on that, too, after um, you, Connecticut and Wisconsin talk about that. I also just want to remind the audience that Dr. Goldman is also available for questions. So if you have um, some uh, questions about what he presented his research, we feel free to put those in the chat as well. So again, the question was, how do you connect with 988 and where do your calls come from? So Jenna, do you wanna take it first? Sure. Yes. Um, this looks different, I think, with every state, just based on how 988 and how many centers each state has. Um, lucky for you guys, we also have our Wisconsin state um, 988 uh, expertise on the call as well. So I will tap Caroline if needed. But um, Wisconsin has kind of lucked out in that we only have one call center. Um, so all of our funding goes through one source when it comes to 988 services. We work so closely um, with 988 um, and they handle all of the calls for our state. Uh, interestingly, we are also, again, county run state. So we have a lot of other services that are already provided through each county, including county crisis lines. Um, so that being said, when it comes to mobile teams and mobile response and dispatching of all of that, um, our 988 hub, our 988 center has created tons of working relationships with all of our county crisis centers so that should there be a need for a transfer call, should there be a need for a next level of intervention, that that call is then transferred to the county crisis line and they then handle that call from there. 
I don't know if that answered your question, but hopefully it did. Thank you. Dana? Yeah, so um, in Connecticut, uh, we also just have one 988 call center. The United Way of Connecticut um, is our 988 crisis call center. Um, and so yes, uh, any calls that come in to United Way, um, they are able to do a warm transfer uh, to the mobile crisis team in the area where that person is located. Um, so that's one mechanism by which uh, they're able to connect to mobile crisis. And then our mobile crisis teams also have direct phone numbers um, that individuals can call uh, and they can just they can just call them directly. So we also in Connecticut, in addition to 988, we also have um, an adult uh, crisis line that we implemented prior to 988. It's called our action line. It's an 800 number. Um, so we, there's really three mechanisms by which uh, mobile crisis can be accessed, 988, our action line, or by directly calling the mobile crisis team. I will piggyback, Dana, that reminded me, because we are county run, pretty much all of our mobile crisis services and that mobile crisis response is not through 988. It is an option, of course, um, but most of our mobile response is going to be um, individuals who are calling those county crisis lines. Great. Thank you. Dr. Shaw, did you uh, want to make any comments or? Uh, to that point, I think the, those were two great examples of just the diversity of how uh, 988 is linking to mobile crisis care. And you know, at SAMHSA, it's definitely the vision that the pieces of the crisis continuum are tightly linked. Um, but, you know, 988 is about a year old. Um, Although the lifeline obviously was around for much longer, but with the 988 was the impetus for this connectivity to care. And so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there are some challenges also when you think about the geo routing and geolocation um, elements of this, and, and that um, especially in, you know, we're a very mobile population in our country. And since 988 does not ping to the closest tower, but according to your uh, area code, that that can be a challenge when locating an on-demand physical response as well. And there are very active talks with the FCC that the 988 office um, is engaged in to, to continue to, to strengthen uh, that and not have, make that a barrier. Um, so there, there are some elements there, um, but it is the vision and goal that we will get there, um, but we are well aware that we're not there um, at, the, at the moment. Great. Thank you so much. So Darcy Miller had uh, responded to our confusion and uh, she said the on-call question uh, was really more for Dr. Goldman regarding his research with the conflict 24-7 coverage, um, but the crisis teams don't seem to have enough staff hired. So I'm going to uh, let you respond to that, Dr. Goldman, but also suggest that it might be something we also deal with right in the informal dialogue because we had several people make some comments on that one. Um, yeah, thank you. So it's a great question, the on-call versus in-person. We actually asked, do you staff your program on-call or in-person? And it was split about 50-50 um, in terms of on-call all the time versus in-person all the time um, versus a combination. Um, so it, it was across the board and not so correlated to catchment area signs. So that was interesting because we had the same thought that you did. Um, uh, and totally appreciate that, like actually staffing these programs up full, full scale 24 seven with enough staff and teams to be able to respond to the volume is a very tall order and, and very much challenging. Um, uh, and I think the, the 46 hour question that was, that was related to one of the others. Yeah, that comments, was the training. Um, but hopefully yeah. that helps with the. Yes. The Thank you so much. So we have another question that's kind of about how programs intersect, and this one comes from Shannon Fox, and it is, what are the relationships between your mobile crisis teams and your state's uh, certified community behavioral health centers if your state has functioning CCBHCs? Dana, do you want to start? Sure. Um, we do have CCBHCs, um, but um, our mobile crisis teams really function independent of the CC, so independent of them. Um, uh, so, I mean, some of our CCBHCs also have mobile crisis teams, but they're not funded under the CCBHC, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Montana. And Wisconsin does not have CCBHCs, so I can't speak to this. Dr. Just say, Dr. Goldman, yes, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to jump in. It's a great question, and it's um, uh, it's an area that is in need of a lot of further development. CCBHC financing mechanisms, whether it's through the CCBHC expansion grants that are directly provided by SAMHSA, or through the CCBHC demo, the demonstration project that's funded through the Centers for Medicare Medicaid Services, really primarily through Medicaid using this. Um, prospective payment system rate setting methodology, all of them require a relationship between the CCBHC outpatient clinic and crisis services. And the CCBHC uh, 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 guidance was just updated. I know Dr. Shaw was very involved in updating um, those CCBHC criteria. And I mentioned all of this to say it's complicated but important, and um, the National Council for Mental Wellbeing, this um, medical director institute group that Dr. Shaw and I both sit on, is planning a paper, like a whole sort of research process to develop some guidance on this specific topic, since there are so many CCBHCs out there that need to have relationships with crisis system providers. So that's sort of a stay tuned for more. We're hoping that'll come out sometime next year, because it's a really big question that needs a deep dive um, to really flesh out more. Yeah, and the National Council who provides the technical assistance for the CCBHCs um, is also just did a, a couple of webinars actually on the intersection of crisis care and uh, CCBHCs as well. Um, so yeah, the, their, the relationship and, and how we're trying to strengthen the relationship between the two um, and the DCO relationships are the designated collaborating, collaborating organization relationships um, that can happen for CCBHCs with some of the components. Um, that's some way that some of the states and or local CCBHCs um, are also connecting to the more robust crisis care system, such as their broader state sanctioned mobile care system. Great. Thank you. We have a couple of questions in here more about staffing models, and I know Dana touched on this a little bit, but it says, this is from Jennifer Holder Edwards and says, Dana and Jenna, please provide information on the staffing models, especially around licensure, education, experience, et cetera, for supervisors and line staff. And then Melody Parsons asked, are all of your crisis clinicians licensed? So maybe um, we could just take both of those together. So Dana, did you want to present or could you have any further information? Sure. Um, yep. Um, so uh, for our clinicians, um, we do require that they are either licensed or licensed eligible. Um, so uh, it, it could be um, an LMSW who's working on uh, getting licensure and is under the supervision of an LCSW. Um, so those kind of associate level uh, clinician positions, um, those are for our essentially for our line staff clinicians um, and supervisors, uh, we do require uh, those to be licensed clinicians, yes. And Jenna? And then for us, our kind of staffing, um, I guess, not even certification or licensure requirements, but just level of um, experience is outlined in an entire administrative code. So the administrative code that we have for the state of Wisconsin that oversees all of our crisis services has in there outlined what's um, required for staff. Um, it's not it's not that it's that they're licensed, all of them, um, but one of them, and typically a supervisor at minimum, has to be licensed to sign off on um, response plans, notes, all of that kind of stuff. So there has to be someone who has a license um, within that team. Um, the, again, being county-based, we um, have a very broad admin code when it comes to how we can staff these um, crisis units. So some counties get to say, well, we want all of our people to be, you know, um, clinically licensed, and then they do. Um, and some counties are like, well, we are in a population of like 6,000. We are going to 
you know, have the one licensed clinician and, and have, you know, bachelor level staff. So um, it's really up to the county to sort out that, um, but there are administrative code rules when it comes to um, licensure for, for the supervisor in that program. So we also right. take people who are IT, which I think Dana was talking about, which is in training and they still need their 3000 hours or whatever. So you might be an LPC IT um, and, you know, still get your notes signed off by a fully licensed uh, clinician or supervisor. And, and I think Dr. Goldman, your research showed there's, there's just a lot of variability, right? On what these teams look like across, across the country. So thank you both very much. Um, the next question um, is, comes from Ted Letterman um, at NRI. It says, do you find it makes a difference in hiring and retention based on how you schedule mobile crisis team staff? For instance, eight hours versus 12 hour shifts and that having people work weekdays a few weeks and then shift to evenings or night other weeks versus hiring people who only work during the days. So do you find that flexibility is helping you uh, with your hiring and retention of staff? So um, definitely the um, differing uh, hour shifts, so 10 to 12 hour shifts seems to be making a difference. Um, we haven't actually yet tried that um, change from going to weekdays to evenings or nights. We haven't tried um, that type of a, of a schedule switch yet. Um, so I can't really speak to that, but actually I like that idea. And that might be something that I suggest as one of our other strategies to try. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Stephanie Laflame uh, that asks, if any, if either of your states or if uh, Dr. Shaw, Dr. Goldman know of states where they require additional credentialing um, to be able to start an involuntary hospitalization process, is that part of what any of the mobile crisis teams are doing? Um, so I, I can actually speak to that. Um, so we do in Connecticut, uh, we have a statute that uh, only permits certain licensed professionals on certain DEMAS funded or DEMAS operated teams to be able to write what we call an emergency certificate, which is, um, it's not an involuntary hospitalization, it's um, a request for somebody to be further assessed at the ED. So we're not saying that they have to be hospitalized. We're saying that we want them to be further assessed. Um, and so in Connecticut, uh, per the state statute, um, it used to just be LCSWs and APRNs, but last legislative session, LPCs and LMFTs were added to that. So now it's those four licenses, LPCs, LMFTs, LCSWs, APRNs, um, and there are six specific teams in Connecticut um, that those licensed professionals must work on in order to be able to write an emergency certificate. Um, I won't go into what those six teams are, but we do have very specific regulations around that. And they need to attend an eight hour training. It's not a specific credential, but once they go through the eight hour training, um, they, they get kind of like, uh, certified or they're, they're approved and um, they're given a number um, that they use on the emergency certificates for, for that purpose. Great, thank you. Any other comments from our presenters on that? State laws are quite variable in, in this space, so. Absolutely, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Okay, uh, next question is, again, it says Jen or Dana, but I, open, I would open up to everybody. It says, have either of you ever heard of separate uh, mobile crisis teams sharing peer support specialists to cover a region during off-peak hours as a means of consolidating resources and minimizing staffing costs? And I do think, Dr. Goldman, this was another one of those things that you, that you saw does happen, yes? Staff sharing? Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it's a, you know, from... What we gleaned, it's sort of, uh, it's a double-edged sword. It can definitely help with flexibility because 
having shared staff means when you've got a lot of folks in your facility-based unit and not a lot of calls coming in, then you can flex staff that way. And when you get a lot of calls and things aren't so busy in the unit, you can flex them that way. The hard part is what happens when you're busy on both ends and then you got to make some tough calls. Um, and so, uh, you know, it really depends on volume and flow between the different programs and how you're balancing those components. Um, I will say that one thing that's worth considering is in terms of shared staffing and arrangements between outpatient programs and mobile teams, which does sometimes happen, um, you know, mobile teams are, you know, getting called and demanded whatever the calls come in. Outpatient clinics tend to have a pretty regular flow during daytime hours, of course, and then they need to staff like an off-hour crisis line for their patients. It can be very advantageous for those relationships between outpatient providers and mobile crisis or other crisis providers to like really explicitly outline, you know, having mobile crisis staff cover those off hour lines to free up the office staff from having to do like additional off hour coverage shifts so that they can focus on that outpatient work and having the crisis folks really focus on the crisis work. But then by protecting the outpatient folks, for, like to be able to do their day jobs, that then lets them be freer to see folks who need post-crisis follow-up. And it can kind of like be a sort of supportive closed loop where crisis is helping outpatient, outpatient is helping crisis. Those kind of arrangements, including through MOU, can be mutually advantageous. It's hard to get to a win-win fully, but um, but I think you know there there are some models where that's been demonstrated, and CCBHCs theoretically might also be a mechanism to support those kind of arrangements. Great. Well, thank you all so much. We are um, at the end of our Q and A portion of uh, this. Uh, offering. I want to give a huge thank you, of course, to SAMHSA and then to all of our presenters and all of the participants. This has just been a, such a great session. Um, I want to remind everybody that the next peer-to-peer -peer learning session is going to be on children and adolescents and mobile crisis teams, and that information will be sent in the near future. And to remind you that all four of our presenters who will pop back up on the screen momentarily are going to be available for the next 15 minutes uh, for an informal dialogue. Um, we're going to turn the recording off and just we're going to unmute everybody so you we can just have a, a, some informal discussion. Um, so with that, we will uh, move to that session, sex uh, part of it. Thank you so much. <laughs>